Good afternoon and welcome to the work session, the January 24th, 2019 work session for the Henrico County Public School Board. Members of the board, we've had a chance to review and see the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor of approving the agenda indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries, the agenda is approved. The first thing we'll do, welcome to everyone. I should begin with that. Welcome and thank you for spending your afternoons here with us, uh, as though you had a choice. Um, but thank you nonetheless. So our first order of business on the agenda is to move to closed session. Uh, for the purposes of discussion of matters covered under items A1, A2, and A7 of section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended, pertaining to the following, the assignment appointment, performance disciplining, and release of contract for specific school board employees, including the evaluation of the superintendent, the admission and discipline of specific students, and consultation with legal counsel pertaining to actual litigation involving special education matters, which such, where such consultation or briefing and open meeting would adversely affect the negotiation, negotiating or litigating posture of the public body of the school board. Is there a motion that we move into closed session for those purposes? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. We'll now reset or move to closed session. Thank you. Good afternoon. We'll reconvene from uh, having been in closed session. <laughs> Members of the board, um, is there a motion to certify that only those matters that were identified in the motion uh, moving us into closed session were discussed? So moved. It's been moved by Reverend Cooper. <laughs> I'm trying to do it right, sorry. Is there a second? Second. second. It's been seconded by the rest of the board. <laughs> All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it, thank you. Madam Superintendent. Thank you. For the first item, um, we have Andy Jenks here along with the 2018 Christmas mother, Angela Harper, to provide a report that reflects um, Henrico County Public Schools contributions. Um, and so we'd like to turn it over to them. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board and Dr. Cashwell. We are pleased to share with you the overwhelming results of the 2018 Henrico Christmas mother campaign. Students and staff enthusiastically participated, contributing $12,200 worth of monetary donations, new and gently used books valued at $6,800, toys, apparel, toiletries, and other gifts valued at $25,624, and approximately 121,000 food items were collected valued at more than $184,000. As you know, every school is encouraged to be creative and participate at a level of their choosing. And while we certainly don't consider it a competition, we do appreciate and celebrate the impressive efforts. The spreadsheet of school totals is there for your reference, and we want to give just a brief shout out to a few of the folks who you see in your materials. In the Brooklyn District, for example, Glen Allen High School collected more than 11,000 travel-sized toiletry items. Ratcliffe Elementary in the Fairfield District collected just over 1,000 cans of food. Pocahontas Middle School in the Three Chop District collected money, food, and gifts valued at more than $13,000. From the Tuckahoe District, Godwin High School students donated more than 43,000 food items. And Seven Pines Elementary School in the Verina District reported 1,944 cans with a thousand of them coming from a single student who engaged friends and family in that effort. This collective spirit of giving resulted in an overall donation total of $228,686, surpassing the 2017 total by $48,000. It is certainly evident that this annual tradition of neighbors helping neighbors is developing students to be global citizens by gaining an awareness of the needs of others, allowing them to be active participants in meeting those needs and directly impacting the community in which they live. At this time, I'd like to recognize the 2018 Henrico Christmas mother, Angela Harper, and Angela, on behalf of all of Henrico County Public Schools, thank you for the, t excuse me, for the time that you've invested and uh, spent educating students on how the donations are organized and how they make their way to the Henrico families who are receiving assistance. It is a vital part of the process, and we will turn it over to you now to share some remarks. 
Well, thank you very much. It is an exciting time. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the school board, Dr. Cashwell and all present. On behalf of the Henrico Christmas Mother Council, I thank you for the support that you, the students, the parents, the teachers, and all staff provided that resulted in the amazing increases in donations this year. The number of food items increased by 25% over last year, and the total value of all donations increased 26%. This is astounding to me and to the council. I had the opportunity to attend many school assemblies and was impressed by the enthusiasm of the students to giving to their Henrico neighbors in need. Thank you for providing these opportunities for Henrico students to understand that they are people in need in their own community and to be a part of participating in helping their neighbors from kindergarten through their senior year. Who was helped this year? The total families receiving help were 1,431 with 4,190 individuals in those families. The total children, which would mean from birth, not just school age children, but from birth through seniors in high school, were approved were 2,271. Their families received food, clothing, books, and toys for the children. Your donations also helped our senior adults and our disabled adults. There were 726 adults who received gifts and food. The council members especially appreciate the equity ambassadors who came to the warehouse on November 30th and helped prepare for shopping days. The council gave one outstanding achievement certificate to Olivia Stegler, a senior at Deep Run High School. Olivia founded It's a Wrap two years ago, and over the past two years, she has gathered 2,400 rolls of wrapping paper that are given to our clients. And those wrapping paper rolls make it possible for the recipients to wrap the presents so they can be hidden until Christmas Day. Because of the partnership we have with Henrico County Public Schools and Henrico County General Government, the Henrico Christmas Mother can provide food and gifts to make the holidays happier for our families. Thank you so much and happy 2019. Well, before you step away, there may be others on the board that want to add as well, and I certainly encourage that. But you, one of the words that you finished with was the partnership, and uh, it truly is a partnership. Uh, you know, we, we often talk about the Henrico way um, in, a very, in a lot of different contexts. But there is no greater context uh, in which it applies than this. And I know you've seen it for many years. Uh, and now for an opportunity to, to see it from this perspective and also to lead it. And your leadership uh, has been uh, remarkable and greatly appreciated. And we are proud to be a, a partner in the partnership of which you lead. So uh, you, you've done a remarkable job. And it uh, is just amazing. Uh, the students and the faculty and everybody who responds. Uh, but the effort, in fact, uh, is, is remarkable as well, and we sincerely thank you for that. Well, thank you, and we are blessed to have many volunteers mm -hmm. that help us. Not only do the donations, people donate their money and others, but they donate time, too. We have people from the whole region that come and donate their time. Our service organizations, for instance, Mickey Auburn's uh, association, I spoke to her group uh, before, and I know that Trinity United Methodist Church, where Mr. Pike mm -hmm. is very active, all of them are part of the solution, the way we are able to help so many people. But the volunteers, it takes about 600 volunteers throughout the year to do it. So I'm just the spokesperson 
for a year and um, as and I follow in the trail of 76 previous spokespersons. So it is a <laughs> wonderful opportunity to help and thank you so much. The Henrico Way is alive and well when it comes to Henrico Christmas Mother. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Yes, Ms. And being one of those 76 that followed you, I have to say that uh, Mrs. Harper, Angela, has done a wonderful job representing the council this year and demonstrating to our students how to be servant leaders. And that, that is one of the, the best aspects of this partnership is to really have our students to reach out and to understand what it what it means for the true spirit of giving during Christmas. So thank you so much. I know you were in a lot of schools and um, I saw you everywhere, but you are, were a wonderful face and a wonderful leader for our group, the Henrico Christmas thank Weather you. Council. Thank you. Very much so, thank you. Thank you, Angela. Well, thank you very much for that. And it's, it's, a, it's a great way to uh, kind of wrap up last year calendar year and as we lead into the next calendar year so uh, madam superintendent the next item of business is under your um, category as well it is thank you mr chairman the superintendent recommends that the school board approve the expulsion of student case number 18-19-s Dash six for violation of the code of student conduct and of course names of students are protect protected under the virginia freedom of information act Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Before we entertain a motion, I just would note, as we always do, that the students that we're going to be considering and we'll be considering by a uh, confidential student number, that these cases have been considered not only today, but also the materials provided ahead of time. And uh, it's um, with great seriousness that we consider the recommendation of the superintendent. So. Uh, board members, you've heard the recommendations of superintendent regarding case number 18-19-S-6. Is there a motion regarding uh, the superintendent's recommendation? It's been moved by Ms. Cock that we adopt the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Ogborn. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. The motion carries. Thank you. And for the next item, I recommend that the school board approve the expulsion of student case number 18-19-S-12 for violation of the Code of Student Conduct. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion regarding her recommendation for expulsion of student case number 18-19-S-12? So moved. It's been moved by Mr. Pike. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Ogborn. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. The recommendation is adopted. In addition, I have another recommendation for expulsion. I recommend that the school board approve the expulsion of student case number 18-19-S-13 for violation of the Code of Student Conduct. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation regarding the student. Is there a motion? So moved been moved by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Cock. All those in favor of adopting the superintendent's recommendation for expulsion of case number 18-19-S-13 indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. The motion carries. Thank you. For the next item, the superintendent recommends that the school board approve participation in the Grad Center for student case number 18-19-S-6. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation regarding uh, student 18-19-S-6 in participation in the grad program. Is there a motion? So moved. It's been moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Second by uh, Reverend Cooper. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, ayes have it. The motion carries. Thank you. The superintendent recommends that the school board approve the appointment of administrative personnel for the 2018-19 school year. Thank you, uh, Madam Superintendent. Members of the board, we've had a chance to review the superintendent's recommendation regarding these administrative appointments. Is there a motion regarding uh, adopting her recommendation? So moved. It's been moved by Mr. Pike. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Cock. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? Eyes have it. The motion carries. If you would provide those uh, names, please, yes, for us. Yes, thank you. The board has just approved Adam B. Field, Capital Projects Manager, as well as Aaron Brooks, Capital Projects Manager, and um, both individuals, I believe, will be introduced um, at this evening's monthly meeting. Okay, and at that time, we'll make sure, uh, obviously, with the ambitious uh, construction and maintenance program that we always undertake, but we currently are uh, accelerating, uh, those folks will be greatly needed and put to work right away. So thank you for that. All right, thank you. And for the next item, I am pleased to share with you the proposed annual financial plan for fiscal year 1920, which represents the division's next step in investing in our students, staff, and schools. And I believe you'll see that we've been able to develop a responsive budget proposal that continues to meet the needs of our students, their families, and our community stakeholders while pursuing our school board's vision that all of our students have the support they need to be successful. And so the development of a budget like this is only possible through the hard work of many schools and county staff. And before um, I have Mr. Sorensen come to the podium to present um, the proposed annual financial plan, I would like to publicly recognize the tremendous effort that Mr. Sorensen and his budget team have put into the development um, of this product this evening. So kudos to you and thank you for the tremendous effort that's gone forward to bringing forth this proposal today. Thank you, Mr. Sorensen. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. I, I would like to echo that, uh, if I could, real quickly, please, before I go to the presentation. Uh, back to Rose, the budget and finance staff. Uh, these guys have put it in a tremendous amount of work to get this this budget done to, to present to you today. Actually, you can say everybody on this side of the room has answered probably at least one budget question throughout this process. <laughs> and really provided a lot of help. It takes a lot of people to put this together. So I would like to thank everybody for all their help. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board, and if I can go into the budget presentation, it is a, a pleasure to present this to you today and we'll walk through uh, what I'm going to talk about today is the general fund budget highlights. We'll talk about the county target, uh, one significant reallocation of existing funds, and then we'll walk through uh, a couple summary slides and also, of course, talk about our special revenue fund budget. We get many requests in during the budget process. All of them are good ideas. All of them would help our students, but we really need a way to prioritize those requests. So we do turn to our cornerstones, and that is a great tool to help us prioritize what should move forward or what we should recommend uh, the superintendent include in her budget. So uh, we, we do refer to those throughout the budget process. Uh, the budget process, this slide talks about some of the ways we, we gather input for this presentation. We do go out in the community and hold stakeholders input meetings. We have one in each magisterial district. And of course, you guys have a couple of public input sessions as well during your meetings. So I mentioned those things because they are specific to the budget process. They are certain venues we do just during the budget process, but we're constantly collecting input. Um, when the principals meet with their directors, that oftentimes floats up to DLT. The budget office makes a note of those. When board members contact staff about a call from their constituents, we also record that information too so we can bring it up in subsequent budgets. So we're always uh, collecting information for this process. Once we have information, we do work with the, with the county and school staff, as Dr. Cashwell just mentioned. That is a continuous conversation back and forth. It's been going on for several months now. And then ultimately, it goes to the division leadership team to, to look at all this information and work with the superintendent to uh, have her make her proposed budget. Enrollment, of course, is a very important piece of, of our budget. Uh, much of our state revenue is based on our enrollment projection on a per-pupil basis. And then on the expense side, of course, we do staff based on our projected enrollment. We are projected in 2000, for the 2020 budget, uh, pretty much a flat enrollment down four students. And actually, the next several years after 2023, we are showing a slight decline in our enrollment. So it's pretty flat the next, the next several years. So let's talk about the budget in detail now. We do have four operating funds. They're in the left column there listed down the page, the general fund, debt service, school nutrition, and state and federal grants. We can go over to the 2020 proposed budget. We are proposing a total financial plan of $621.9 million. The largest piece of that, of course, is the general fund budget at $505.5 million. It's a 4.2% increase over the current year's adopted budget. The debt service budget is also going up by about 10%, so that we have to pay the debt on the bonds that we've issued for our construction projects. Uh, school nutrition, I do want to talk about that for just one second. You will see a decrease of 10.4% in the school nutrition budget. 
So one of the advantages of having a new employee come into a position is they ask a lot of questions and look at things. That's exactly what's happened in our school nutrition program. We do have a new finance person over there. She has, has gone in and asked a lot of questions. And she's looked at our spending patterns compared to what we budgeted. We simply aren't spending what we budgeted in prior years. So we've taken an effort to realign our 2020 proposed budget request with what we've been spending in, in prior fiscal years. And finally, state and federal grants. I'll walk through some of the highlights in those later in the presentation, but we are proposing a 5.3% increase in our state and federal grants. Again, a total proposed budget before you of $621.9 million. The last line of that, Code RVA. Um, so Code RVA is its own school board, makes its own decisions, has its own budget, but we do want to include that on this slide because we are the fiscal agent. So we will actually load their budget into our accounting system. So we just wanted to disclose that that is the Code RVA's budget. You guys do not take any action on that. But before you leave that slide, a couple of things on Code RVA's budget, that $661,000 increases, is it that represent the fact that this is the last year of, I think of a new class coming in it does yes sir a, no, a near year a new year group not a new class but a new that year. is correct yes sir. okay and then on school nutrition the, the question i have for that is that it's always been my understanding school nutrition is a an enterprise fund it, it pays for itself for the most part yes sir so if we have if we have budgeted is it that we haven't received as much revenue as well as what we budgeted or have we had surplus I, can you fill in some gaps for that for me, please? I'm glad you asked that. So it, it, is, it is a self-sustaining fund. Um, so we simply haven't received the revenue, nor have we expended the funds in, in that account. Okay. So in fact, we, we've had a zero budget there. Absolutely, okay. yes, sir. So I, I should have said earlier, this has no impact on their financial standing, has no impact on what we charge our students for lunches. It's simply the budget has contained more revenue than we've collected and more expenses than we've expended. Okay. But we do have a very sound fund balance in that program. It has no ba no impact on their financial standing. Okay. All right. These are just two pie charts, really just graphically showing what I, I just walked through. So on the left side of the page is 2019. On the right side is 2020. And again, there's a $621.9 million I just walked through in the previous slide. And it does show certainly that the general fund is the largest of our operating funds at about 81% of the total budget. So because the general fund is so large, I would like to walk through each item that's in, that we've added to the, to the proposed budget. Uh, we did try to put it in four different categories, so it's a little easier to walk through. So this is the employee compensation and benefits category. You see three items on there, health insurance. This reflects about an 11% employer share increase to the budget. The compression study, uh, we presented to you guys last month about the, the findings of the compression study. We do have $3.8 million in our, our budget for that. And would like to remind you, this is the first phase. So in 2020, we'll have the $3.8 million, and that addresses the realignment of the teacher salary scale. In 2021, our plan is to move forward with, with career ladders. So again, this is the first phase of that process. The last item in there is salary reviews. We, we continually look at uh, people's workload and their salary to make sure they're in line with one another. So we wanted to add some money to our, our budget so we could go forward with a more, more uh, better funded system and more systematic process to address those salary concerns. That's $75,000. Uh, before you leave that, so that, that's, not a, that's not compensation or benefits, that's operational funds to study compensation. No, I'm sorry, it is, it is compensation and benefits. We, we call them desk audits. Okay. So we'll go through and, and people that we think may have had additional responsibilities placed on them throughout their tenure with the school division. We'll go back and review those responsibilities to make sure it's in line with where they're, they're, they're graded in our compensation scale. So this $75,000 would be used to, to, to right a wrong, if you would, to, to even to improve a salary to yes, reflect sir. the response. Okay, so yes, it sir. does go. It's not a, it's not a cost of a study. It's not the a study, result it's of actual the, compensation okay. to employees. All right. So we, so it's, as things stand right now, uh, the employee benefit side of things, in addition to any raises Correct. or anything else, is going to see a, a net increase of $8.8 .8 million. Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay. And then, as you suggest, there is a footnote on that page that later on in the budget process we'll, we'll learn more about what pay raises may or may not be given to all okay. employees. Okay, but before we even get to that place, there's an increase of $8.8 .8 million. Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay, thank you. So the next category we want to walk through, it's a long title, but it's teacher classroom supports and pupil teacher ratio reduction. 
Um, so there are two pages, two slides for this, so kind of we'll walk through some of these items. The first line, the $3.2 million, if you recall, this fiscal year after the budget was adopted, the Board of Supervisors came back and provided $3.2 million. So the plan would they would provide $3.2 million in fiscal year 19, in fiscal year 20, fiscal year 21. The first line, excuse me, the first line on there, the $3.2 million, that's the amount of the current fiscal year, 2019, that we have to add to the base going forward. So we've already, as it indicates, 44 FTEs are associated with that money. Those positions uh, have all been filled and moving forward, most have all been filled and moving forward with that. The next 12 lines I'll, I'll show you is how we propose to use the, this year's, the 2020, $3.2 million. Okay. Generally speaking, it's $3.2 million, but basically we're using a million six for that for PTR reduction and a million six for teacher supports. Okay. So the next line is PTR reduction is 11 FTEs and we'll hold those throughout the summer and as the enrollment comes in and gets finalized, we'll assign those teachers as, as we need to, to make sure we have appropriate uh, PTR ratios. You'll see several lines in here of elementary, I'm sorry, special education teachers or special education ex, um, instructional assistants. The next two lines focus on teachers at the elementary and secondary level, six for elementary and five for secondary. Gifted Young Scholars Academy at Wilder, this is the continued expansion of that program, four FTEs at $300,000. English language learner teachers, and of course that population of our students is, continues to increase. We want to uh, enhance what we're offering those students, so we're adding three teachers in that category. The next line would be elementary special education instructional assistants. The final line on this page is student teacher res uh, residents. So that's a program we're in with v VCU where we hire provisionally licensed um, teachers that haven't done their student teaching. They come work for us with a year with an experienced teacher. And then after that one year, there is a, a three-year commitment to work for the school division. Before you leave that chart, so the last two items are both focused on uh, special education uh, students, correct? Yes, sir, they are. Okay. And the... Um, Madam Superintendent, the, the edu instructional assistants, are those, it shows full FT, four, six FTEs. Are we moving to a position where we're going to have more FTEs, uh, more, more full-time employees in those positions? Yes, these the are additional um, allocations, but you'll also see in the financial plan how um, several current um, part-time positions will be converted to full-time. So this would be and additional full-time positions okay. on top of that. Because that was something that, that has been not only identified in the report that was provided, but it also has been an ongoing issue, I believe. And the ability to, we have a 30-hour employee yes. who obviously the better they are, the, the more effective they are, Correct. the more uh, attractive they are for someone else to hire. And uh, the more willing they are, ordinarily, the more they're able to work mm -hmm. full time. So the fact that we can keep more of those people full time and now hire six additional ones is important, I think, to begin to address some of those issues. So yes. I'm glad to see that. And so not only do those final two um, items on the list address special education, but also the addition of um, five secondary um, and six elementary special education teachers as well. And that that'll show up somewhere else, or is that? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Oh, Mr. Montgomery. Oh, I see. I beg your pardon. The, the third and fourth lines. I, beg, I did overlook it. I beg your pardon. Okay. Thank you. And one last question. So the three point, the fir very first line is three point two million. That's in effect a repeat of the previous three point two. Yes, sir. So yes. it's now if if we cumulative, it's six point four. Yes, sir. Correct? That is correct. And we have another tranche of it, so that we will end up being. 9.6. Correct. Uh, and then, and then 9.6 going forward. Being our base going forward. Okay. Right. All right. Okay. Thank so, you. Yes, sir. So uh, on this slide, start at the top, secondary special education instructional assistants. We do, uh, followed by two early childhood special education teachers. We're also proposing uh, two FTEs for school psychologists. One would be an intern. Also in our Title I fund, we're paying for community engagement coordinator. Well, our work really goes beyond our Title I school, so to make sure we're in compliance with that grant, we're simply moving that position from Title I to the general fund. Early Childhood Special Education Assistance follows that item, two of those folks at $66,000. So the items I just read through, that's the 2020 increment of the $3.2 million. 
the 1.65 that that gets you to 3.2 million yes sir it does okay thank you yes sir okay so the last two items in this category elementary planning period so this is the second year of this initiative we started it in, in the current fiscal year 2019 uh, in the current fiscal year, we had, again, about 22 FTEs. Most of those were STEAM teachers. So going forward, uh, we don't know if they will continue with the STEAM teachers or look at some of our other uh, opportunities in elementary school to provide a planning period for elementary school teachers. One of the areas that we're considering would be in the health and PE. So it's, it's possible that if we go down the health and PE road, instead of hiring all teachers, we could hire some instructional assistants to the mix. That would allow us to stay within the million six on this slide, but because instructional assistants are uh, not as uh, expensive as teachers, we could roll out to more schools. So these are options that we're weighing moving forward. The initiative is alive and well to provide planning periods to elementary. It's just where we continue using STEAM or is there another avenue that we can accomplish the same goal? Madam Superintendent, when will you um, bring forward your recommendation about how you're going to do that? I know we've had some conversations yeah. about it, but yeah. what's your timeline for uh, making that decision? Very soon. Uh, oh, I apologize. I'm turn okay. that on. Um, in the very near future. So we know that um, with that 1.6 million, um, our intent is to try to move beyond what was originally planned as a three-year phase in for elementary teacher planning and try to move into potentially some of the schools that would have been identified for the third year. So we're working up some scenarios to try and stretch that um, just as far as we can. Okay. Um, so. And that's where some of the, if you were able to do something with the paraprofessional, you could because right now that's uh, that's seventy five thousand dollars per for the twenty two, mm -hmm. and we've already seen. I think we saw on another line we have a uh, immediately above it we have instructional aides at about thirty three thousand dollars, and those are full time too. Correct. Correct. The the two thirty three thousand dollars. So you, yes, sir. Obviously the mm -hmm. um, and of course everybody else is doing the same thing, so the market's going to tick yeah. up some but nonetheless it's a and I think by looking at some alternative scenarios we'll also potentially be able to accomplish another one of our objectives which is to increase the amount of time our students spend in health and PE and physical education so if we can do that um, in the same vein as working to advance elementary teacher planning then um, that would be a positive thank you there um, wouldn't be an additional Mrs. Cost. Yeah. yeah thank you mr. chair um, how can our um, instructional assistants help with the health and PE? How do they fit in? Because you said some of them might be instructional assistants. How does right. that help? Like me to, I'll, I'm happy to speak to that. Okay. So um, this would allow um, a health and PE teacher to see more than one class at a time. So oh, okay. if I'm a health and PE teacher, I might have two or three instructional assistants assigned to me to plan with me and work with me on health and PE. And so we might be able to receive, for example, two or three third grade classes at a time. Okay. Um, that allows all of those okay. teachers to have planning, potentially some common planning, and then for um, us to be able to provide instruction. Okay. And I have just one more question on this slide. The equity and diversity operating budget, um, what's going to be covered by that expenditure? Right. So there, there would be some, some, some temporary help um, in, that, in that area. Um, I think some secretarial assistance, but also supplies and program materials, con ed ed educational pieces, because we have some of the, the programs that we want to do. We just need funding to okay. implement those programs, do the okay. education pieces. and. Uh, with our students and staff and community. Okay. This is Cox. Um, thank you. Does that include personnel? I'm not sure you, if it was personnel, human resources as well. It would. It would include some 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 help for her. To do okay. That, yes. it's, it, it is not a full time position. Just some just some assistance for her. Gotcha. Anyone else? Before we leave, with that sixty thousand, what does that bring that budget that line item up to? I do not know that question, Mr. Montgomery. If I can get back with you, that, please. Uh, that's fine. All right. Anyone okay. else on this slide? March on. Very good. So the next uh, next category that we have for you is instructional enhancements. So again, just walking down this slide, new classroom expansion. We are uh, we will have eight new eight new classrooms, and so that's the staffing to go with that. Uh, reading specialists want to spend a few minutes on that. So reading specialists is an initiative. We would really like to have a reading specialist in all of our elementary and preferably all of our elementary and middle schools moving forward. As you can imagine, that's a large uh, endeavor to do that. So we want to do this over, over several years. There's only five, there are only five positions in this year's proposed budget. Um, 
because we want to stop and look at our existing staff. Can we reallocate some of our existing staff and use those positions as reading specialists moving forward? So we kind of wanted to understand what our options are with our existing staff before we add a lot of new positions. But this is something that you will be seeing in the next couple of years as we move Here's forward reading. with putting reading specialists in all of our elementary mm -hmm. schools. Textbooks and tech books, also want to spend a few minutes talking about that. So we have a line in our budget for textbooks. Um, back before the recession, it was about $2.4 million. It's mm -hmm. less than a million dollars now. So we really wanted to focus and put all the resources that we could, and I'll talk about textbooks in a couple slides from now as well. But we really wanted to put resources in, 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 in this line. Um, so $300,000 $300, will go in our base budget to go forward in subsequent budgets. Um, the reason why we have tech books up there, we don't want people to think that all this money is going to be spent on paperback books. Some of it will be. We do need some of those. But also tech books refers to digital uh, textbooks, if, if you will. Okay. So I will come back to tech books and textbooks a couple slides from now. Code RVA okay. tuition payment for our final 18 slots. Uh, so the slide before, that was Code RVA's total budget. This is our piece that we're adding to our budget that we send to them for our, our, our slides. So, so, for example, just so it's clear to, to people, and since I've sit on that board, I can speak to this. So, for example, when we show back on that initial slide of um, we show a six hundred sixty-one thousand dollar increase, that's from all the participating Correct. jurisdictions. Yes, sir. And our portion of that is the um, number that you just said there. One hundred eighty thousand. Yeah. Right. So, of the six sixty, one hundred eighty thousand of it's because we're adding our final 18 yeah. slots. So it's about, t it's the tuition's $10,000 a, a student. Yes, sir. Uh, achievable dream, we're adding the fourth grade. Of course, that's at Holland Springs Elementary School. Additional operating supports for schools, we are proposing. That's about a 5% increase for our school's operating budgets. Uh, again, this is something we hope you see in the next few years as well. Microeducation Foundation Innovation Grant. So, so HEF currently offers grant. Teachers can apply for grants for different ideas they have to improve in instruction in their classrooms. HEF funds those grants. We'd like to, to help HEF in that effort. If there are ideas that, that have been proven successful, we'd like to step in and help support those ideas, whether we keep them going in the school where they currently are or expand them throughout the division or some portion of the division, we, we would like to start looking into that endeavor, and that's what the $100,000 is. English language learner specialist, a few slides ago, we talked about three ELL teachers. So this is a specialist. We currently have one specialist doing world language and ELL. We just think it's a great time to, to, to break that position in two, if you will. One for world language, one for ELL, and this is the $98,000 that we can do that. Band equipment and school technology. Uh, you heard me talk about this in the current year's budget. We're simply trying to restore those accounts to pre-recession levels. So as we re need to replace equipment, money's there so we can replace it. The furniture replacement is a new item that, again, we hope to increase throughout the years, but we are starting with a, a $75,000 amount, and that's to re systematically replace furniture in our, in our schools moving forward. Mr. Montgomery, this goes to your question you asked Dr. Cashwell. So the special education instructional assistance, it's a little odd seeing a funding of zero and 15 FTEs, but this is doing exactly what you asked about. We have temporary funds to pay for temporary instructional assistance. We're moving that money to a full timeline so we can convert 15, uh, so we can create, I guess, if you will, 15 full-time full -time. positions from that temporary money. Okay. So there's no increase there, but there's money in the budget for it. This just shows us zero increase. That is correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. No, uh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go Are you sure? Ahead. Okay. <laughs> One thing that, that might be helpful, um, and I'm not asking for a change now, but uh, like, for example, on that line where we show that there's 15 FTEs, a, a column that shows, because that's 15 additional, and it, would be, it, would, it might be meaningful to say that that's 15 additional on top of whatever the number is now. But that's actually... This would be um, 15 converted to full-time from part-time. The additional were on the prior slide, which I believe was six additional um, yeah. to, what, to our current. Correct. Yeah. But I, I understand. So this would be 15 that are moved from part-time to full-time. Right. But even though, so if you use the other one, though, anywhere there's any. An ad. Anywhere right, there's again, an added, because it doesn't saying. just show um, 
it, as much as it's helpful to highlight what we're adding, I, I think it's also important to know what the what the bottom line is, what it ends up being, mm -hmm. both in FTEs and um, and in the dollar spent. Um, you know, it's it, we can remember something from year to year, but but for example, when I asked a question about equity and diversity operating budget, and it's sixty, yeah, seeing an increase from what? Yeah, so that now it's a yeah, total of yes. whatever. We can provide that because if it went from full time instructional assistance, now we have two hundred in X. Yes, Perhaps, right. yeah, whatever. If right. where it's meaningful, it yeah. would be. And, yeah, and we the, can do that. Yeah, and frankly, I think it would be helpful to the to the public mm -hmm. as well too, because more unless you unless you're really focusing on the fact that this is additional. If you just happen to come across this slide, it doesn't paint the full picture of, of the robustness of a particular program, such as uh, uh, instructional assistance in special education. Just a thought. So, I'm sorry, Mrs. Ogburn, you had a question. Absol I do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Henrico Education Foundation Innovation Grant, that line, um, I sit on the HEF board, and this is something that's come up several times. and. Basically, just for anybody that needs an explanation, um, there are grants that HEF has, has done over the years that have recurring costs, but there are also some grants that they're looking at. Should the school system take over those grants because they're now becoming more commonplace, which is what I'm hoping is, is, is part of this as well. For example, a number of schools are asking for maker spaces, a number of schools are asking for so many things that they're not innovative anymore. They're almost standard in things that um, schools should have. So the board um, approached me, approached Dr. Cashwell. We began to have this conversation, so we passed it along to see if we could fit it into the budget. Um, and, and I think that this will allow HEF to really stick to what it is, what its mission is, which is being innovative and supporting teachers and trying new and different things and um, will help spread the wealth a little bit. And then we take on the charge of continuing the good work that they've started. So I'm really glad to see it there. I um, think that will help their mission quite a bit. Right. So thank you for that. Um, Mr. Montgomery. Right. Yes. Mr. Uh, I think it's great uh, that we've got those replacement categories in there that they've been put back in that's really important uh, do you know how that um, how they will be dispersed um, I, I I do not know how they'll be dispersed but I'd be glad to get that answer for you I'm just you that. know thinking uh, we have a lot of conversations about equity Correct. and as we take a look at the school system we know that there are a lot of needs out there uh, so it just would just a little bit curious about that but glad that they're back in there certainly I'll, I'll, I'll get that information to you thank you yes sir anyone else very good. Thank you. Right. March on. So the last category is operations enhancements. Uh, we talked about we just approved the two, two appointments for construction project managers. Those positions are currently in 2019 being paid out of the capital budget. We're going to move those to the operating budget in 2020, and that's the $225,000 that we believe we need to do that. Bus drivers, um, you know, communication with our parents and teachers is really important when a bus may be a little behind schedule or a bus breaks down, a bus number changes. So we really want to have dispatchers in place so we can keep that line of communication open with parents in, in schools um, to let them know what's going on each morning and afternoon with their, with their students. Central Automotive Maintenance, that's uh, the, the, the county performs maintenance on our fleet. The county, they are raising their hourly rate. They provided us the differential for that hourly rate increase of $187,000. Construction coordinators, that goes with the construction project managers. You know, we talked about the three schools coming online shortly. And so with, with all the ongoing work the construction and maintenance has, uh, we really felt we needed to give them all the support they could to make sure they got those schools open. And we're very confident with the work. Uh, this, I already talked about another referendum with all the meals tax projects. We're very confident through this work to keep, keep them going uh, after these schools open. Contract lease increases. We just went through the budget in all different areas to look at our contracts and the in inflation uh, kicker in those contracts. It's $172,000 to keep us whole with our existing contracts. Compliance officer, this would be an HR. So we have a compliance issue or, or an investigation that needs to be done. We're really dividing that responsibility between HR staff, between DLT. We really need to have somebody that can devote all their time to work on our compliance issues and some of our HR investigations. And that's what this position would do. Payroll benefits and FMLA specialists. So the couple things with this position, um, 
when an employee goes on FMLA, we really want to en enhance the service that we give that employee. And it, it, oftentimes it's a tra traumatic time in their life. We want to give them support and help working through the process. So that's one piece of this position. <laughs> The other piece is that we are moving forward on a, on a, a more frequent pay cycle, and so this position will certainly help uh, fill the gap in the payroll office as we pull resources away to help the implementation of a different pay cycle for our employees. And finally, EpiPens. EpiPens is something we need to, to have in stock. They're several hundred dollars a piece. We just wanted to add money to the base budget to make sure we, we have the funding to replace those on an annual mm -hmm. cycle. Mrs. Cox? Do we have those in all schools? Is that what this is set up for? I believe the answer is yes, but I'll make sure that's true. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? But before you leave that, uh, you mentioned the uh, increase in pay in the frequency of the pay cycle. Yes. So that since we since it's part of the record now, could you tell us a little bit more about timing on that and what's going to happen? Well, we're still working out the, the, the details with our, our counterparts at, at the county. Well, tell um, us what you know. I'll tell you what I know. <laughs> we are working towards, the, our goal is to have a semi-monthly <laughs> pay cycle. So did, employees get, did you say... Semi-monthly, twice a month? I did say that, yes, Outstanding. sir. Outstanding. Yes, sir. Um, so our goal is to have a semi-monthly pay cycle implemented by the end of the year, the end of the calendar year, calendar in, year. End of, in, so in December 31, 2019 to begin January 1, 2020? That's our goal, yes, sir. That's our goal? Yes, sir. To have two times a month payment. Excellent. There, there, I, will, I, do, I do have to have this caveat, uh, <laughs> if I could, please. No, that's, so, you're good. So, you stop there. You're fine. <laughs> So there is some discussion. The county pays on a bi-weekly cycle. So there's some discussion if we need to go with their bi-weekly cycle. That certainly complicates the issue a little bit. Mm -hmm. But we think we're at a point where we can go forward with semi-monthly, but we're still okay. working on those details. So it's just a difference of pay frequency. A, a, a pay, there's 26 if you pay. Well, every. if we were all 12-month employees, yes, it would be that simple. Right. But because we have 10-month contract, 11-month contract, it is not is not that easy right and so we're trying to work through those nuances with the county we do think we're at a place we can go forward semi-monthly but but we're not quite there but that's what we're working towards. okay good well thank you for that update i know there'll be other people that are glad to hear that as well indeed yeah. all right thank you anyone else on this particular slide mm -mm. all right all right i think Oops. i've said enough on that slide if we can <laughs> <laughs> So I do want to talk about reallocation of some existing funds. We, we, we currently provide $1.1 $1 .1 million of funding to the Math Science Innovation Center. And when we look at the priorities of our budget and look at all the needs of our students, um, we certainly appreciate the programs the Math Science Center offers. They do certainly have a value. But looking at, at some of our base budget needs, uh, we are proposing to eliminate funding from the Math Science Innovation Center and reallocate those funds within the school division and keep them in our budget. So I want to walk through uh, a couple minutes of how we propose using those funds. So again, if that chart shows $1.1 million for the Math Science Center, we would take those out and we would use $600,000 for tech books or textbooks and $500,000 for technology infrastructure. So what our plan is, over several years, we want to build that textbook fund back up to where the pre-recession levels. So what we're proposing to do, I talked a couple slides ago about the $300,000 in our base budget. We want to supplement that with $600,000 from the Math Science Center. So in 2020, we'd be putting $900,000 additional dollars in textbooks. We would plan to do the same thing in 2021. So that leaves us $500,000. We want to use that for technology infrastructure and laptop fee reduction. So we would use the other $500,000 in 2020 and 2021 to go towards our technology infrastructure. That would allow us to reduce our laptop fee from $50 to $25. So we hope over the next couple of years to really get that base budget built up in our, in our textbook account. And then we take the whole $1.1 million and put it in our technology infrastructure and eliminate the laptop fee in 2022. Okay. We're good? Mm-hmm. So I just want to summarize some of the, the general fund items I, I've been through. Uh, you guys have seen these charts probably every budget presentation. The one on the left is 2019. The one on the right is 2020. And these are the categories in which we report our expenditures to, uh, to the state. Um, so we would always like to see instruction, the biggest piece of the pie, and clearly it is the biggest piece of the pie. It's increasing from 19 to 20 
from 75.7% to 76%. Um, so you can see the different categories there uh, of how we are proposing to spend our money in 2020. General fund revenue, uh, we'll have more information on this slide later on in the budget process. Currently, the slide on the right, FY 2020, shows a, the, a target increase. That target increases the green, the green sliver, and it's not divided between county and, and state. Um, so we will do that later on in, in, in the budget process. But these, these slides, even with that caveat, these are what you would expect to see in any school division budget. The locality and the state are going to be the two largest funding partners. So we spent a lot of time on, on, on the general fund because that is such a large piece of our, of our budget. But I do want to walk through special revenue, if I could, for just, just a minute, please. So the special revenue fund is really primarily our federal and state grants. Uh, most of these funds are associated with a specific use. So when we get the grant, the, the grantee tells us, the grantor tells us how we need to use those funds. So the first two bullet points I do want to spend a minute or two on to talk about. We do, we are proposing a new fund. And our special revenue funds is the special education regional classroom grant. So the Department of Education historically has, has funded special education regional programs. Region one has never been a, a part of that. It's pretty much in Eastern Virginia and Northern Virginia. The state is stepping away from that, that funding, that, that program delivery and that funding model. Um, so what, what they're doing now is we have a regional classroom. We actually have two regional classrooms. Um, they're going towards that approach of a regional classroom versus a, a whole school or regional uh, program. So doing that, they're trying to take some money from the, it's, 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 it's 59 school divisions that for years has had uh, all this money. They're trying to wean those divisions off of some of those funds and make it available to folks like us who have never, have never had access to those funds. We are budgeting about a, a million dollars in 2020. Um, it's an evolving conversation with the Department of Education. In fact, we're meeting on it the first week of February to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, at this point, we're not proposing to, to, to spend the whole million dollars. We want to make sure it plays out. But we are pretty confident of about $660,000. So we are proposing uh, 20 full-time instructional assistants. And this, Mr. Montgomery, goes back to what you were talking about earlier. Could, you know, these are new instructional assistants that we could use to offset some of the, 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 the temporary funds. It's different funds we're doing it in, but it's, it's, it's the same exercise. Um, so other grants, we are proposing a million dollar increase in, in school improvement grant. These, we have a reserve for state and federal grants. So that, we, it's just what it says, it's a reserve. We have money set there so that every time we get a grant, we don't have to come back and ask for a new appropriation. We've had it in our budget for a, a few years. But because we are having uh, success getting grants, we are asking for an increase in, in that fund. Increase in the Advanced College Academy program, this would be state revenue based on our, our participation. We are proposing a decrease in the state technology grant that would align our budget with our spending pattern. And we are proposing a decrease in the laptop fee collections because we're taking money from the Math Science Center and using those funds in the general fund. So it's an offset in the special revenue fund. And then finally, uh, we, do, we are proposing um, a change to the VPI Plus and VPI programs just based on uh, the, the governor's proposed budget. We are also proposing a grants account that would paid out of the indirect cost account. Most grants provide us a percentage we can have for indirect costs, the, the, the cost that we spend to manage those grants. So we have enough funds in that grant, we're comfortable uh, asking for an accountant to help manage our grants. So I you know, just talked about we're increasing our reserve because we are getting more. We want to make sure we follow all the rules and regulations of those grants, and we're asking for an accountant to do that. And then just one, one last bullet point to, uh, for transparency that we are realigning the school nutrition budget to be more in line with historical uh, revenue and expenditure trends. Are there any questions before we talk about next steps? No, the only, it's not so much a question as an observation. If you, if we, since school nutrition is a, is a standalone fund, if you will, and since our, we're showing a $24 million, $24,150,000 increase, that also represents a $2.6 million decrease. If you completely take out school nutrition, so you take it out as a reduction and as, as a line item, we're actually showing a, an increase of, of about four and over four and a half percent versus the four percent. So it's a, it adds, I mean, since that's, it sort of stands alone. Right. And, and it, often it may have 
showed us, made it appear that we had a bigger increase. Right. But in this particular circumstance, since we're reducing it, it actually has a reduction to the bottom line. So I think of, 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 while it should be, it's reported correctly, I think it's very accurate to say that the, that the direct support to students outside of school nutrition, because that's certainly direct support, but is seeing an increase of 4.6%, so, which is significant. Yes, sir. So, got to count every one of those percents we can. Absolutely. So, okay, good. Thank you. All right. And I can just walk through the, the next steps with you guys. Uh, January 24th, obviously, this is where we are today, the presentation of the budget. On January 30th, staff will present the budget to the county manager and his staff at the county government center. On the 14th, you all will have a, a, a public hearing. February 19th, we will present the budget to uh, TAC. February 28th, the budget comes back to you all for approval, and then it goes to the county manager for inclusion in his budget. March 20th, we have our legislative review with the Board of Supervisors at, uh, at 9 o'clock that morning. April 9th, the county has their public hearing. The 23rd, the Board of Supervisors will adopt the budget. It will come back to you guys for adoption on May 9th, and then the fiscal year will begin on July 1st. And while you all look at the dates, if I could just add, I think the budget staff gave you all lots of reading material, a uh, mm -hmm. book of, of detail, um, a flyer that we can give out. It really it does a nice job summarizing the budget. It's a two-page flyer with a superintendent's message on it and some charts and basic budget information. And then um, another summary budget document to go through. So, uh, of course, please look through those and let us know if you have any questions. We will get, get right back with you to make sure you're comfortable with what's, what's been presented to you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Montgomery? Yes. Okay. So I know in a little while we're going to be talking about our salary compression. Um, but I think that I think our teachers and our staff really want to know where we stand on raises um, and what our thoughts are. I know that we it's a little early for us to know that percentage, but I think that they need to know that we as a board support raises and are working in that direction. And can we speak to that a little bit? Certainly. Yeah, I think there are a number of ways we can communicate, um, though it is early to take a stance on a final um, position with raises. Um, Chris, you may be able to give some, some idea on a timeline of when we may be able to at least give some preliminary communication to our staff in a way that alerts them of the board's keen interest on the matter and our attention to preparing a budget that maximizes the potential for a raise without being able to provide an exact amount at this moment. Yeah, it's, 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 it's difficult to answer that question. It's something that you know, the, the, the county really works on and, and pay raises are a priority on, on their side as well. Yes. So it's certainly something that, that uh, they work on. They're keenly aware that our neighbors have given 3%. You know, mm -hmm. I have had those, those discussions with them. Mm -hmm. um, but really, we really won't know a firm number, unfortunately, until probably March or so during, during the, the budget process. Um, but they are keenly aware of what our, our, our neighbors have, have given out or what they proposed for their employees. I think in advance of that, if, if it's the will of the board, we could certainly um, prepare a message for our staff to be aware of where we stand, at least at this moment in time, and um, our position in trying to create a budget that allows for, as I said, maximum potential for a raise. Well, well, I, uh, go ahead, Mrs. Scott. I beg your pardon, yeah, Mrs. Ogburn. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just one quick question um, related to the governor's announcement, uh, and he talked about this yesterday at our VSBA conference, that his goal is a 5% raise for SOQ-related employees. If you could explain, because I know teachers and staff are hearing a lot about that, but how that's going to affect the possibility of a raise for our our staff as well. Sure. Well, one, one important um, item to start with in the, the governor's announcement is his 5% is over a two-year period. So it, it wasn't, if you read the details, it's not just for fiscal year 2020. Right. So we gave, um, depending on your tenure with the division, you received either 2.4 or 3% raise this year. So obviously the difference between you know, that 5% is what we would need to give in 2020 to qualify for the state funding. But to Ms. Ms. Ogburn's other uh, point, the, the state funds the SOQ positions. So it's a long formula, but basically the state has an average salary. So they're not even looking at Henrico County data, they're looking at average salaries. And then they look at the SOQ positions. We have far more positions than what the SOQ provides, as do most school divisions in the Commonwealth. So um, just in rough numbers, a 5% pay raise for us is over, over $20 million. 
the governor's budget has about $8.7 million. Just the way the funding formula works. And then there's the local composite index applied even to that formula I just walked through. Right. So um, while certainly we appreciate everything the state wants to provide for us, we know the pay raises are important to the state, to, to the school board and board of supervisors. We certainly appreciate that support. But, but there, there, there is more that I would like employees to understand based on that analysis. Well, well and it does get more complicated in Henrico because of the unified pay plan. So right. it's a, while this, try to be polite. It, it is attention grabbing and everybody is hopeful that we will get funding, but we have to add, it's also predicated on matching funds if Correct. I'm yes, um, not mistaken. So yes, it is, it's something we have to wait and see and don't everybody get too excited all at once because it's, like you said, it is over two years. Correct. And then the other piece to remember, this is the governor's proposed budget. Right. That, that's all Who it knows? is at this point. Who knows? Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Chair. That's all right. Thank you. So to follow up on a couple of the 5% over two years, is it two and a half and two and a half or 5% for two years? 5% for two years. Okay. And um, as you mentioned, do, do you know roughly what the percentage is of, of, of SOQ positions versus the total? I do not know. Okay. I don't. I, I mean, it's, if it, know, if it takes, um, it. if it takes $20 million to do what we're getting 8.74, you can do, it's about two to one. Are, are, are approaching two to one. Yeah, I think it's a little more because the, the local composite index comes in on right. it as well. So yeah, there are there's there are a lot. There's some nuances to it, but there's correct. but there's a significant portion of it that even if, if, if that is not addressed when the state provides uh, a uh, an increase at the first place for the number of SOQ level uh, positions that we have. Secondly, because our our salaries are are almost ex are always higher than the state average Correct. and then finally because we have the the county uh unified pay plan so there would be a so if it costs 20 million on the school side it's going to cost some significant amount on the county general county government side Correct. Yep. so that eight and a half that 8.7 million could could extrapolate out to 40 million or so it, depending on how all the math works out. Right. So there's a, uh, the, the uh, matching is not a dollar for dollar matching. Oh, if it we're is gonna, not a dollar No, for it's not at all. So there's a significant outlay at the local level, particularly in Henrico County, Correct. to accomplish it. The good news is that it is Henrico County, and we, we, we are, um, uh, are good with our resources and strong in our revenues. So, but anyway, so that's a, as far as, I don't know what our, what our comments would be other than we are for salary increases, uh, but we certainly, and we certainly, as we work with our counterparts at the at the general government level, uh, I know they echo that as well for not only the general government employees but also for the school division employees. So, Mr. Chairman, and, yes, and Mr. that's Chairman. exactly what I, I really want that out of here for today. You know, because I didn't want us to have no mention of raises when we all believe that our teachers and our staff deserve raises. Mm -hmm. So I wanted them to know that we are having those conversations and that it's predicated on several different layers as you've expressed today. And I, I just want them to be in the know and um, to be aware that we're fighting for them and working on it. Absolutely. So. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cock, and thank you, uh, Madam Superintendent. So, is there? Um, did you want to? Did you want to? You already provided us with sort of overview of the next steps. Does anyone have any questions about that? Does anyone have any other questions about the the budget itself or the financial plan itself? Well, very good. I know that it represents a tremendous amount of work and tremendous amount of work yet to be done. Um, and so we appreciate it. We appreciate all of your team's work on that, on, on that as well as the, the folks who are not in the financial shop and their efforts on it as well. So, so thank you. Thank you. Team please, effort. <laughs> yeah, please take our uh, appreciation back to them for us. Well, thank so. you. All right. All right, thank you, Mr. Sorensen. All right, for the next item, we have an overview of the current class sizes at both the elementary and secondary levels, and Dr. Teigen is here to provide that overview. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. I am here this afternoon to share um, an update on our class size data for 2018-19 that's based on a snapshot that was taken back at the end of November. 
And in addition to sharing this year's data, you'll see data from, um, in some places, one, other places, two years back, so that you're able to see a comparison. So this table provides a summary of the number of elementary classes that are over 25 students by grade level. And as you see, the columns down, you'll see the grade level, the total number of classes we have at that grade level, and then the number of classes that are at 26, 27, 28, 29, up to 31. Um, that 31 is the maximum class size we have. The classes that you see up there that are 28, 29, and 31 are all zoned gifted programs that providing additional staff would just split that class in two. Unlike when we have classes that are larger at across a fifth grade level, maybe it's going, that is impacting maybe four or five fifth grade classes. Um, so I wanted to make sure that I pointed that out to you. I, I think you should be very proud of the work that you all have done to lower class sizes because we only have 18 classrooms. Um, that are above 25 students. That's a reduction. Last year we had 33, and so that's 15 less classes. And so I do think that we have made great strides, and when you consider the number of classrooms across our school division, um, that's amazing. Dr. Tigan, yes. Mr. Chair, can yes. I ask a question? Dr. Tigan, those uh, classes that are 28, 29, 30, well, there aren't any, 30 and 31, do they have an instructional assistant? Some of them have additional support, some don't. It depends on the, the school and the needs within that program. Okay. But they're the all zoned gifted programs? They're all zoned gifted, yes, ma'am. And two of them are at Colonial Trail? Yes, there is both a fourth grade and a fifth grade class at Colonial Trail. And you'll see that, I'll, I'll advance to the next slide. Okay. Um, here you actually see by school where those classes are. And so it has the grade level that's above 25 in each one of the, the schools that have classes that exceed that, what are, we would consider the optimum class size. We did add 11.2 FTEs at the elementary level this year to address class size. Um, and so you will see that that's one of the reasons, obviously, that we have fewer classes that are over um, 25 students. Some of that staffing, a little piece of it, one was used for adding a zone gifted teacher at Ward Elementary because we were over 32 students. Um, and we also added the point two fragment that's um, hanging out there was to expand the early bird math class so we could meet the needs of more students across the division. Mr. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. No, you, no, you said it first. No, go ahead. Mrs. Cock. Okay. I'll settle this. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to make sure she was uh, through talking about Colonial Trail. Um, I'm you, not, believe me. Okay, well, you know what I'm going to ask about, <laughs> Glen Allen Elementary, which has the highest number of classes that are over 25. Um, we do have, of course, our four classroom edition that we will be starting next school year with. Um, and I really wanted to get an idea of if that is going to take care of this. Are we going to be using those classrooms as needed to get these numbers down? Well, we'll, conti we'll continue to look even not just at Glen Allen Elementary, but at all our schools with trying to get, you know, classes at 25 or lower. And so we'll be looking. We know that, that our enrollment level at elementary is starting to decline slightly. Mm -hmm. And so looking at repurposing some of the um, staffing that we already have at the elementary level, too, to address the the few hot spots that we're having. Okay. And it's also, I think it's really important <clears throat> to note, too, that there, this was a snapshot that was taken November 30th, mm -hmm. and enrollment in classes, especially, and, and it can be across the board, but you see it more in elementary as far as the impact, because as new students come in, and they have, you know, whereas they might have been at 25 or lower on September 30th, when we, you know, we're still looking at staffing, that as students come in, numbers will continue to go up and go down. Some classes are now lower than they were when the snapshot was taken, but it's just one snapshot in time. Are, the, are any of those four classes are gifted classes? Yes, one is, and um, you know, the, um, some of the other classes, not all, but like 
there are some at Glen Allen that is because of some of their students that need additional supports. Mm -hmm. They've chosen to make some classes smaller while other classes are slightly larger. Yes. So um, sometimes it's misleading because a class might be over 25, but the grade level average might be 25 or lower. And so we do provide principals that discretion to how they feel they can best meet the needs of their students. Thank you. Okay. My turn. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, please. Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the thing I notice when I look at this is I, I will totally agree with you. We, I'm happy that we are reducing our number of, of larger classes, but I'm not happy with 18. I, I'm still, I've been talking about this for, I've been on the board for four plus years and I've been talking about it for four years and it is coming down. But what I was so glaring when I look at this, there's one school in the Tuckahoe district, two in the Brooklyn district and the rest are in three chopped. And this is what I get phone calls about. I, I have emails from Colonial Trail parents all the time. And so we've got to do something about Colonial Trail. We, we're, at, we're at the breaking point for the staff and for the administrators there. And to have three classes that are above 25 is just indicative. If you look at the numbers of the classes, they're all pretty, it's pretty tight in that building. And I, I just think that it, there is a glaring problem when you've got so many schools in one district that have overcrowded classrooms. And so it leads me to ask why, why the three chop district? And why are we not actively coming up with a plan to solve this problem? I mean, it goes back to the redistricting we've talked about. We've talked about, um, you know, moving programs, something, but I, I have parents who complain about 31 in a gifted classroom and there is no full-time instructional assistant in there. And if you're gonna put that on a teacher to have 31 students gifted or not, they should have a full-time instructional aid to help them because gifted kids, yes, they're, they can do more independent work and, and all of that stuff, but they need individual attention just like other students do. And we're putting an undue burden on a teacher who has 31. Uh, 31 gifted kids can be extraordinarily challenging. And so I, I think that um, it, it is just something we have to pay attention to. But we also have to pay attention to why this is happening in one district and in one area. And I feel like, to be honest, I'm, it's not directed to you, Dr. Teigen, but there is this complacency like this is okay. And it's been okay for years. And it's not okay with the people who live out there. And, and it, is, it is something that I've been talking about. I have beat the drum as much as I can. And, and it's the only reason I think in a lot of ways we've gotten reductions is because this whole board has said class sizes are a priority. And, but when they're clustered in an area exclusively almost, it, the, the people in this area begin to think, well, we're forgotten. We're, we're, we're not getting what the rest of the county is getting, which is 20 kids in a class. And so I think the time has, I mean, I, I think we're at the point where we need to set a max and it's, cut, it's in stone. And we're gonna say, in our county, we're not gonna have more than 25 kids in a class. And when it becomes 25 in a class, we're gonna come up with a, pro, a, a way to solve it. And yes, we're at 18 and that's great, but that's 18 too many even if it is gifted. But I, anyway, I'll, we'll move on and I, it gets worse when we get to secondary. So it's, um, yeah, I feel like Lisa, my hair's on fire. <laughs> I'm missing her right now. Well, as you see, total number of classes did go up slightly this year because of the number of additional staff. Um, some of that is also because in the total number of classes, there are special education classes that um, were added that increases that number as well. You will see that we're going up in the number of classes that are below 20 um, and going, going down with the number that are over 25. Um, so some of that is, it's you know, always trying to balance where you, you know, can take staff from one place to another in the window of time in which to do that. Um, so that's something we'll, we look at the current 
the current numbers as well as, as projections for next year to start allocating staff for 1920. At the middle school level, um, while we added 5.6 FTEs at the middle school level, um, we continue to have core classes that have more students than we would like. You're absolutely correct. Principals often have to make difficult decisions while, when they're doing their master scheduling. And while they work to meet the needs of all of their students, and this means providing smaller class sizes for those students who have um, greater challenges, or in some cases where they're trying to make sure they're offering opportunities that are available, um, should be available at all schools. And so um, we do see, just for clarification to core classes, are math, science, English, social studies, and world language. The non-core classes are everything else. Um, you know, it's also important to note when we look at the non-core classes that are over 28, you know, PE, uh, band, chorus, those kinds of uh, programs are allowed to have more students, and you'd want them to have more. You want choruses to be able to bring all of those students together in a, you know, or a concert band where you're pulling different smaller group, groups maybe into one for a period. And so they do have higher, often have higher numbers and for a reason. We also know that many of our career and technical education programs are capped due to OSHA regulations at um, 20. You know, if it's a business class or something like that, it doesn't, but even our, you know, family and consumer science classes are capped at 20. Um, so that's important to note too, that we're, those are things we're trying to balance. Um, so anyway, we, we continued this year to do the things that we put in place last year of asking our principals to you know, have to come and ask for classes that were smaller than 20 and get permission um, to make sure that anyone who wasn't teaching a full load, that that was approved by a director. And so those are efforts we're still doing and following through this with. Um, but we also know that, that there still needs to be professional development surrounding master scheduling of how you better balance um, courses ac um, across your offerings. Oh, you. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Scott. Thank I'm you. Sorry. Okay. So um, you can imagine I'm a, a very concerned specifically, specifically about I'm sorry, I got to pull to that side. The Hungry Creek numbers there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Moody is not that much better either. And I'm going to let my colleagues speak with Holman, which also has some of our constituents. But um, we, I haven't had a whole lot of time to go through all the class size information that we got today after we got here. But in looking at this, I mean, I, I totally get it. You know, when you've got the core classes versus non-core classes. Non-core classes, we do expect them to be larger. But I'm looking at these numbers for Hungry Creek, and these are core classes that have 29, 30, 31, and it is, it's almost everything. It's the physical science, algebra, earth science, English 7, life science, English 8, social studies 6, 7, world history, geography. I mean, that's about as core as it gets, mm -hmm. and they are all at 29, 30, and 31, and may I remind you, this was a school that we did this band-aid redistricting and said that we were going to get them down to have less students and you know as of january of 2019 they still have a thousand kids in there so um i i have spoken for our redistricting and I, that's a piece of it too but also do we need more trailers in there now to help the students that are in there now you know what can we do uh, for our current students and then we need to look you know, long version here and look to see, are we going to need a new middle school when we finish this conversation? Are, where, where are we going to go with this um, to accommodate all of these students? Yes, I know the birth rates are smaller. Um, you know, there, there's a lower number, um, but we got to help these students now that are in there. And I'm concerned that we're just letting them go by the wayside. They've been in crowded schools since they were in kindergarten. And that's what I hear. Mr. Montgomery, may I? Yes, okay. please. Thank you. I mean, when you look at the overall, again, it's, it's three chopped and part of Brooklyn. And with Pocahontas and Short Pump and um, Holman, it is no wonder 
I get those same phone calls. I get them from elementary school parents, secondary parents, and Mrs. Cock is right. These kids have been in overcrowded schools or large classes since kindergarten. And they, I feel their frustration. And I feel like we were kicking the can down the road with the redistricting that we did with Holman, but what, I mean, with Hunger Creek, but what we've done is shift the problem around the corner. And so now what used to not be a real big issue at Shore Pump is now a big issue and we've shifted it and Holman is bursting at the seams. So I, I, I agree with Mrs. Cock. What I would really love to see is a, is a plan. How are we going to handle, because our high school numbers are coming in, in a few minutes and those are even, in my opinion, worse. And so what are we going to do to address this problem? It is one that I think we all agree needs to be addressed. We're giving some small fixes in, what did you say, five? 5.6. 5.6. At the middle school level. Right. But when you've got 407 core classes across the county, mm -hmm. but some schools we have as few as zero. I mean, we've got zero at Rolf, eight at Wilder, and six at Elko, and then you've got 65 at Pocahontas and 66 at Holman. Those are the core classes that those kids need to take in order to be ready for high school. We're not meeting the needs of our kids. And so I think we need a plan that's, okay, we're gonna address this problem. This is how long it's gonna take. This is how much money it's gonna take and how many people we need to hire. And, and go ahead and reallocate some funds. We've got an, a big enough budget that I think we can pay more attention to this than we are. And yes, the Board of Supervisors has given us extra funds for this problem. And it's all tied to retaining and recruiting teachers. It's mm -hmm. all part and parcel of, of the problem that the Board of Supervisors and the school board have said we're going to work on, but we can't do it with $3.2 million. It's gonna take more than that, and it's gonna take more of a concerted effort, uh, I think, to, to get these numbers down. And it's gonna take time, I know that. And it, it's already working, but like I said, when we get to the high school numbers, that's where I'm really concerned. And like I haven't said enough, but still, the, you know, the high school numbers I think are even more concerning because those are growing. And, and I don't know what we're, again, Ms. Madam Superintendent, I think we need a plan moving forward, a focused plan on how to solve some of this problem. Anyway, thank you. Mr. Right. Uh, Chair? Yes, Mr. Um, I, I think all of us uh, are concerned uh, about the class sizes, uh, no matter where the schools are. Uh, it's significant, and when you look at those numbers, uh, like's been noted already, um, you know they're unsettling uh, for students and parents and classroom teachers and administrators. Um, you know, I, I'm just uh, we went to a wonderful presentation Monday night about reimagining Richmond and RVA and all the things associated with that. You know, it just seems like uh, school systems are very predictable. Uh, can we redistrict ourselves out of it? Can we re-learning uh, cottage ourselves out of it? Can we <laughs> rebuild ourselves out of it? I don't know. I'm just wondering uh, what other alternatives there might be out there that we could explore that would help us to uh, uh, quickly uh, uh, remediate some of these problems, some of these concerns. Um, there were times when I was a principal that uh, I, you know, I would say the heck with technology, uh, give me three or four qualified teachers that I can do something with. And I don't know, and I probably would find the space within a building to be able to make that happen. Um, but I, you know, I would like to see us uh, move beyond predictable. Uh, what, what's out there that, uh, that could be done that would help us beyond uh, trailers and adding a classroom or building a new school. I, I'm not sure what that is, but um, I, I just would like to see us do some different thinking and see if we can come up with something. And I would always be in favor of hiring more teachers. If, if, if the money's there to hire more teachers and to make an impact quicker, I think that's the way we need to go. Uh, and, and I would challenge human resources to get out there and find them because um, it, it has an impact. Uh, and and uh, that's just my thoughts on it. And uh, I, I have the same concerns that Mrs. Ogburn and Mrs. Cock do. Uh, and uh, just we need to do some 
really different thinking about this. And I'm not yelling at you. I'm just, you know, spouting off. And, I know, I'm spouting no. off too. Uh, but thank you for listening. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Scott. You know, and we've talked before about maybe using some of our, our virtual classrooms too. I mean, we have so many great master teachers out there. I mean, is there a way that we can downsize some of these classrooms by, you know, having the master teacher in another school? I mean, I remember when Glen Allen opened, I'm looking at Mr. Baker back there, Dr. Baker. Um, you know, when Glen Allen opened, we, we had uh, some students that actually were sitting in, or sorry, were listening in, watching um, the algebra class uh, at um, Hermitage um, and things like that. I mean, those things do work too. I know it would cost money to have someone in the room, but uh, possibly not as much as a, as a teacher. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we are not piling on you. We've had so many discussions about this, Dr. Teig, and I hope you know that. This, I, this is, is not news to yeah, her this that is, we feel yeah, this, this way. is not, but, um, you know, I just think that there, there, there are. There are lots of different things that we can do, as Mr. Pike was saying, um, and, and I still go back to that that is, is a possibility to make, you know, to help us a little and, bit. And I think when you, when you think of some of those creative ways of linking classrooms across the county, mm -hmm. a key thing is, is that all of our schools need to be on the same schedule. So, it, you know, you think about, we have some flexibility at our middle school mm -hmm. levels on right. how they do their um, block classes, all of the, um, you know, where they put their intervention mm -hmm. block, the same is true at the high school, and mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not all on double block and, mm -hmm. or on a block schedule. And so those are things that I think are precursors to doing okay. some of the more creative um, connection of classes across the county. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I, I'd, I'd like to continue that conversation piece there for a second. Because um, we also are seeing that with our career and technical education. You know, we have a, a real issue with that. There's additional transportation um, that would help with lower the cost because we wouldn't have that same transportation um, issue of, of four times a day getting them um, to the other classes. So, uh, I mean, what is to, to keep us from, from all getting on the same schedule other than the way it's always been done? You know, I mean, this might be, you know, talking about reimagining, it would certainly help the problem with class scheduling and it would help us with our workforce development when we look at career and technical education too. I, I think it behooves us to look at all those components. Um, you know, the way building schedules are set up at individual high schools and middle schools and making sure that we look at every opportunity that's there. And if there's an opportunity to reduce class size uh, by making adjustments at a high school schedule, then I, I think we owe it to ourselves and to our students and their parents and to look at that. Um, there are all kinds of configurations out there. Um, and you know, I. I you know, I'll, I'll say it publicly, I, I'm a proponent of year-round schools, uh, as crazy as that sounds. I don't know what type of flexibility that gives us, uh, but I, I think uh, when you take a look at this, you know how much heartburn is created by redistricting. We know uh, people do not like learning cottages. Uh, we know that the funding for trying to build extra school buildings or extra classrooms is, is a challenge. I, I just really think we need to look and see what other type of innovative alternatives are out there and, um, and not delay, uh, move quickly to see what we might be able to do. Uh, and I know that's not easy. Uh, I know it takes a lot of work, a lot of conversation, and a, and a, a lot of consensus building. But uh, when you look at uh, 144 above 28 or 143 above 28, 144, 134, it's worth having those types of conversations. Uh, it really is, just to explore and see what we might be able to come up with. Um, okay. Anyone else? Mm -mm. What, one general question, what, what role does the, um, or what effect does the, the, pop, the special education population, inclusiveness in uh, classrooms, what role does that have on the size of the classrooms? Oh, I beg your pardon, not on the size of the classrooms, but on the size of the classes. Um, it, it depends on whether you're talking about a collaborative class of which then th that total count. I think about at the secondary level, if there's a collaborative classroom and say seven of the students have a disability um, in that particular content area and you know, 20 of them don't and you have a class of 27, it's gonna flag as an over, 
you know, as, as whatever, because it's, they're all counted together. However, there are times when students aren't spending, you know, I think at the elementary level, they're not spending necessarily full day That's out right. in the classes. So they're not reflected in those class sizes because they're not on that teacher's role. But at, at the secondary level in particular, yes. if you have a class that has uh, a portion of students with some level of disability, isn't it true that, that it, it's, it, it, the instruction is enhanced when the, when the overall population of the classroom is smaller, yes. lower? Yes, and, and even if we have two teachers in there, we're calling it a class. Like if the, the example I gave you, there were 27 students, there are two teachers. It's still counting as a class over 27, even though you could think of the ratio as much lower than that. Mm -hmm. and, and, mm -hmm. even if you, and if you have one that shows 20 or 21 or 22, if, if, the, if the special education teacher is not able to follow the students in there, because it is a collaborative classroom, but, they, but, they're not, but in every circumstance, they're not able to follow the students, correct? Right, sometimes in some classes there are instructional assistants that will go with the students, or if they might have, they might be a student with an IEP. Correct. And, and have a disability, but it may not be in that content area. So right. I might have a teacher with me in English because I have a, you know, my disability is related to English, but I don't have one in mathematics because that's not where I'm experiencing those learning challenges. But when you do have, when you do have some students who have an IEP of some nature and they have them in the classroom, it, it, don't we make an effort to keep those classrooms smaller yes, as well? That, yeah, that, because of the, the intensive nature of the instruction that's necessary. Correct. Okay. And so that, that's where you'll see some of the classes that are, you know, below 25 mm -hmm. um, and that teacher, that principals will make the decision in the scheduling process to say that, you know, a, a class that's not a collaborative class um, can be a larger one so that I can maintain smaller classes like specifically Algebra 1 at the high school level is one that every student must pass Algebra 1 and pass you know, an assessment, state assessment associated with it. So it's really critical that those class sizes, if they're students with disabilities and it's a collaborative class, to stay small because that could affect the, the success of those kids being able to walk across that stage right. of graduation. And when we look at the numbers in the, in the, in the programs that we've been provided and the charts we've been provided, we're, we're, it's a number that doesn't reflect the, uh, whether that student's a general education student. Obviously, it, it right. reflects whether they're taking honors or they're taking AP or they're taking one of the other levels of courses, college prep. But it doesn't reflect whether the student may have an IEP or special need in a particular area. So it, when we say 20 may not equal 20, there may be a, a concerted effort, just like with gifted students, sometimes it, it take, we look at it and say, well, there ought to be more uh, instructional support there because of the gifted student needs additional things to keep them to, to um, challenge successfully. Uh, same thing goes when we have a classroom with some special ed students who have an IEP or something else that we have to maintain those classes smaller to make sure that the instruction is, is adequate. Right. Okay. And that's not reflected anywhere in these yeah, charts. No. It is not. Oh, thank you. Anything else for before we move to the high school level, right? And you know, what's left? Yes. Okay, good. So, you know, at the high school level, the trend is actually a little better, even though the data is still not, you know, mm -hmm. um, where we want it to be. So we've reduced the number of classes that are over 28 by 103, and then the core classes by 103, and the um, non-core by 17, which I realize 17 is insignificant. Um, so we are trending sort of at least in a better way here at the high school than at the middle school. We only added 3.2 FTEs at the high school level this year. And so out of the staffing that we had to allocate the least amount, most went to elementary, second amount to middle school, and the least amount to our high schools. So again, Mr. Montgomery, can I ask? Yes, I'm yes. just going to ask a quick question. Um, when I last was at Tucker, um, I had a teacher come up to me and said that part of the problem he thinks is that you have, especially with the specialty centers, you have teachers who teach one class of what, whatever it happens to be, and 
because of the nature of our specialty centers and high school instruction in general, you have so many teachers teaching one class that it affects the overall complement of the number of teachers allocated to that school. And so I know it was a couple years ago, um, you did an initiative to make sure that all of our high school teachers were carrying a full load and that we're, I mean, how far are we along in that um, initiative to be sure that we're, we're getting the bang for the buck out of this, the people we do have? Well, and, and we have continued that process. Um, and occasionally when we come across a building where you know, they might have had everything good before school started and then someone's teaching less than they were, we have, we have addressed it with the principal. Okay. So, I mean, we're trying to be, you know, consistent on our expectations and our follow through mm -hmm. with that so that, because it does, it not only impacts that school, and a lot of times that leads to complaints from within the school, as well as it impacts the rest of the division if, you know, if they have complement that's not actually teaching that should be teaching. Right. But it is the fact that to some teachers are teaching a one-off class, especially in our, does that, in your opinion, affect these numbers as much as it I think some teachers think it does? It affects it in the, in the fact that if I have a singleton, which is what we usually refer to them when there's only one section of something, mm -hmm. that it, it's only offered once, so you know, the schedule will bind up who can get into it and who right. can't. Right. And so you could fluctuate, and maybe you have it set at a 28 max for an AP class, but then more kids' schedules will let them get into it, and, you'll, and you can override it to increase it, because teachers usually want all of the kids who mm -hmm. want in their class there. Right. But every teacher should be teaching, you know, five or six classes over the course of, you know, two days on the block schedule. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't matter whether they're teaching singletons or they're teaching a class multiple times. The issue that to me that that has is as a teacher, if I'm teaching multiple singletons, I have multiple preps. Right. Mm -hmm. And while right. oftentimes secondary teachers have multiple preps, you don't want teachers that have four or five preps. Right. And that sometimes can happen and sometimes it's because teacher, teachers specifically want to teach certain classes. Um, sometimes it ha it's how the schedule rolls out based on what students need. We try to do student-driven schedules so that it's about what students want and then you try to make the schedule work to that. But our, um, sometimes what makes it hard when I talk about the balance of classes is when you have a lot of singletons, it becomes harder and harder to balance across the, the other sections of different classes because of kids who want those specific classes can only get in the certain blocks that they're offered and so then it packs up other blocks. And so um, that's where the challenges come and our, our schools that have more than one specialty center, that increases. That's the, that's the what Tucker is facing with and, three specialties. And specialty the same centers. thing can be true with your collaborative classes mm -hmm. because usually that's where you start mm -hmm. your scheduling is with your collaborative classes so that you're sure that your teachers can have planning time with their co-teacher. <coughs> you wanna make sure that they're in their content area that of the special ed teacher that's their expertise. And so those things tend to bind you know, bind up the, cal the, the schedule that then leads to an imbalance across where you have classes that are 21 and another one that's 29. Right. And you think just move them, and it's not that simple just to move the kids. Do we need to examine how we are de determining the needs of a high school? For example, since we have so many one-offs and, and that kind of thing, and they're having singleton classes, do we need to look at how we're allocating teachers at our high schools and determining what their needs are. Because it seems to me that, I mean, we can see it in the, the actually the next slide, when we've got 2,000 classes over 28 kids, that something's wrong somewhere. And I wonder if it's in that allocation formula and if how we're, if we've only added three new teachers over the, all of our high school, that's nothing. I mean, that's, we, you know, that's great, but we could, I would love to know what do we, that's why I asked, I think we need a plan. What do we need to do to, to attack this problem? Well, and I would say, and 
this is sort of a guess based on the number of, of schools and students that we have. Just to, re you know, and I'm talking the overall average, just to reduce the overall average at Midland High Schools by one student. So let's say our, which is, you know, that's part of what you're doing to get mm -hmm. class sizes lower, um, is probably 55, 60 FTEs. Hmm. It's significant. Well, that, and that's what I think is the missing the number for us is, you know, three's not going to do it. No. Three is a, not even a drop. <laughs> not even it, a drop in the bucket those little tiny band-aids <laughs> right and and so what do we need to do to get these numbers down it it looks i mean from the numbers obviously verona has room but that's it, it, verona has virtually no classes above 28 but all of our high schools do mm -hmm. so there's a solution to this and there are a lot of smart people in the room that can put their heads together and come up with something that we can work on. I just don't think at the high school level we're given enough time. So, if I may, yes, uh, please, Mr. Chair, uh, I believe that um, there are probably multiple lenses through which we need to address this issue, and so um, certainly looking at adding additional complement over time is one strategy, and we'll definitely continue to entertain that. But I think. Um, it goes beyond that to what's been mentioned before, which is thinking of innovative solutions. With When we look at just our current um, high school model, for example, teaching courses within very um, rigid content silos, uh, we see a lot of examples of innovation around the nation where by doing some course combinations and those sorts of things, you're able to alleviate some of that. Of course, virtual um, has a lot of possibility in reducing some class sizes. I think there are a number of things we can begin to explore, and, and we certainly hear you loud and clear and um, we'll take that information back with our teams and begin to do some brainstorming and I think some of it's also creative master scheduling um, at the secondary level and there are some things we can do to work with our um, administrators at the secondary level to see some immediate relief so um, and, and then that of course then there's the issue of the comprehensive redistricting and looking at available seats and whether or not there's you know the potential um, especially in the three chopped area at the elementary level specifically um, with the ad potential addition of a new elementary school so I think there are lots of factors here but um, we um, certainly have heard the concerns and share them and would like some time to go back um, with the team and begin to at least um, tackle this from a number of different angles Mr. and bring that information back. So um, Dr. Teigen, when um, the county determines where they want to build housing, I think you know, the, 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 the system must be broken because this is systemic for all of our schools, you know, plus or minus a few that aren't as bad, elementary, middle, and high. I think that conversation, I need to know more about that kind of conversation because, I mean, I don't think they were working too well together because if we were, we, this wouldn't be as bad as it is. I mean, because it's, it, it just keeps on, you know, it doesn't stop. I mean, to add that many full-time employees just to get one down I mean, that's, that's significant. And I just think that, you know, we, we know where the concentration of growth is going toward Goochland, West End. We get it, you know, not this way, but that way. But we can't keep building and, and having people move in and then our schools not be able to accommodate them. I know we don't like high schools over, say, 1,100, 1,200 kids. We might need to start looking at our models for building these schools. I mean, we're, we're modeling Verina and, I'm sorry, um, uh, Highland Springs and Tucker after Glen Allen, but Glen Allen's already overcrowded this, the, the school that we're building. So I mean, at what point do you say, you know, we need to look at all of it comprehensively from the county side to our side, because I don't think the conversation is, is working too well. <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes. I, I completely okay. concur with uh, Reverend Cooper as well. I mean, every time I turn around, there, there's a new development that's going on in Brooklyn or in Three Chop particularly. Um, and these are impacting schools that are already overcrowded. You know, as I said, you know, Hungry Creek is still over a thousand, just like it was last year with the redistricting. And there is still River Mill to come to affect that school, um, as well as two other areas that I've heard of recently. So, um, you know, these are things, conversations that we also need to have on the table. Absolutely.
Mr. Okay. Chair, just yes. real quick, yes, and a, a new subdivision, a, a new apartment complex in Innsbruck that will affect Hungry Creek and Holman and Springfield Park, and it, it is massive. And, no, and so I think you're right, whether it's a new um, elementary school and middle school, or we look at, at redistricting, something's got to give, especially in that area. Well, I still think that there, there still needs to be a conversation for all of those parts. Oh, absolutely. Because I think that there could be some immediate redistricting. There are some seats out there, and I think that it's fiscally responsible for us to fill the seats that are out there, mm -hmm. and then also to look to that future as well. Right, absolutely. Okay, anything else from anyone? So this, this, except for Reverend Cooper. This, so this, <laughs> so with the previous stage, this is just the overview for us just to get it. So we're kind of throwing all this stuff at you. So, okay, I got you. Thank you for listening. Thank you. You're Very welcome. Much so. Had you gotten to the uh, conclusion? The last, yeah. the last one was she She's ready to go. It, She's ready to go. Like, let me sit it. down. The numbers speak, for, you, know, um, you know, the numbers are the numbers. And, yep. you know, we do know that continuing to work on, you know, developing those master scheduling skills that are needed to balance as best we can. I mean, there's always challenges, but there's, there's also things that we can do to try to help mitigate some of those challenges that we have. Right. Um, but I will say, too, that it's, it's hard for our secondary schools to get compliment after a year has started because it's very hard. You're looking for bits and pieces of teachers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, trying to, to provide them with the, the resources before they're working on their master schedules is often important. And, you know, I will say like Short Pump Middle School got some additional staffing, mm -hmm. but they're using it in a more creative way that you're not seeing in the data because they're not a te you know, a newly hired teacher doesn't necessarily have the full course load that the other teachers do, but can do push in. And we do that sometimes at the elementary when we add a teacher late in the year when numbers keep growing and when we have complement and can, you know, assist them with class sizes that are getting way too big at the elementary, um, they'll use them in a creative way that might not be reflected in the data, but it is reflected in the classroom as far as how that, that additional staff is used. It's sort of like an IA, only you have a full-time teacher mm -hmm. that's qualified that can, you know, fluidly pull students in different groups, different ways to be able to work with them that doesn't impact the number of classes, you know, the class sizes. That makes sense. Yes, I, I'll ask one more question. You said these numbers, um, this snapshot was taken at the end of November, correct? Um, we usually do this how often in a course of a year? Normally we've done it once at this that's, time of year. It's what I thought. We've tried to be consistent on, on when we pull that snapshot because it, 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 it is a moving target. I mean, I, I know at Colonial Trail, when I talk to the principal, he's like, that class isn't that size now because he lost a student over right. the holidays. I'm like, I understand, but I can't change. It was a snapshot, you know? Right. So, well, that was my question. Could we, instead of waiting until next January to revisit this question, have a snapshot, let's say in May, so we have some idea of moving forward into the next school year, what we're tackling and what we think our numbers, and I don't know if it will help guide us as far as planning over the summer, but I think it would help us with um, our work when we are talking to the Board of Supervisors and, and expressing our needs to have this more than once a year. And so let's say we get it in January, we get uh, numbers in June or something like that. I, I mean, even if it's just running the numbers like of this end. current school, the 18-19, yes. how they're scheduled. Right. Just and another so snapshot can, just like this. Just like this, okay. but at the end of the school year, did the trend, because you just said sometimes in the spring the numbers go up. Sometimes and they go up. So, you know, it, so it would be interesting to see a snap, this snapshot twice in a year as opposed to just once. And let's see in, Back. let's say, June what the numbers are. And I think that would kind of help us see if... It ebbs and flows, and it also keeps the conversation going and one we can have with the, with the board as well. Absolutely. And Thank we you. can put the numbers side by side on That'd be great. the printout, you know. That would be great. So you can see them. Thank you. Thank you. 
Anyone else? Madam Superintendent, do you have something else to add to that? Okay. Not in relation to class sizes, but um, okay. prepared to introduce the next item when you are ready. Sure, I will, as we close, I will just say that uh, 75 FTEs is four and a half million dollars, uh, assuming that you got 75 spots to put them as well. So uh, it's a, it, it's a multi-level, multi, it's a it's three-dimensional chess at, its, at least, so. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the next item, we have um, the first of what will be a number of special education work group um, reports. As you know, Dr. Hamlet provided um, at the conclusion of the um, release of the special education review, next steps, which included forming five work groups to look at a number of areas that address the recommendations in the special education review. This would be the first um, of the updates, and this one is relating to related to staffing. Um, and as you know, we, um, of course, at the timing um, of the report and the recommendations coming forth coincided with budget planning. And so you see that in our proposed budget, we've begun to chip away at some early areas related to special education staffing. But of course, um, this work group is tasked with looking into the future in a long-term fashion um, as we look to do some long-term planning to address the recommendations. So without further ado, um, Dr. Hamlet will make introductions and then Donna Stavenport and Cassandra Willis um, will take the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell. Um, I'm here really just to do a brief introduction, and Dr. Cashwell did a great job at um, setting things up for me. The only thing that I'd like to, or a few things that I'd like to add is um, the staffing subcommittee, which you will hear from today, is the first of the five. Um, once we wrap up all five reports to you, we will then bring the larger committee back together um, to look at trends and ways that we can maximize those recommendations to make connections and then come back to you with a more comprehensive report of recommendations that may have some additional budget implications moving forward. Um, each subcommittee has been meeting on a regular basis and is co-led by an HCPS employee and a community member or parent. Um, so today you have Donna Davenport and Cassandra Willis um, who will be presenting the staffing subcommittee report. I just want to share with you briefly, you know about Donna and her work um, with exceptional education and her expertise, um, but we strategically chose the um, community members and parents who are co-leading these efforts, not just because they're passionate about this work and, and really interested in it, but also because they bring a skill set to the table. So I just want to share a little bit with you um, about who you have before you today. So um, Cassandra Willis, some of you may know, um, has been a teacher in Richmond City. Um, she was a special education teacher of middle school students with disabilities, emotional disabilities. Um, here in Henrico, she was a math coach, a Title I math lead teacher, an educational specialist for elementary math, as well as one of our associate principals. Um, but she is also currently a third year doctoral candidate at VCU pursuing studies in special education and disability policy. She is a fully funded fellow in the Research to Policy Advocacy Program funded by the Office of Special <coughs> Education Programs under the United States Department of Education. And I just want you to hear this. So her, I'm, can you tell I'm excited? <laughs> her research agenda includes special education teacher preparation, um, diversifying the teacher workforce, the intersectionality of race and disability and how educational policy impacts public schools. So we have the perfect team teeing up the first report for you. So I'm just pleased to introduce them and excited about the work of this 27 man and woman team of um, the staffing subcommittee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen of the board, Dr. Cashwell. Thank you for the opportunity to share the work that we've completed so far with the staffing subcommittee. And as Dr. Hamlet just said, I definitely drew the long, exciting straw in um, my co-chair of this committee. She's been phenomenal to work with. The staffing subcommittee consists of 27 members representing a diverse population of HCPS staff members and community members. 
Representatives from the Exceptional Education Department were joined by teachers, school-based administrators, division leaders, human resources specialists, instructional directors, and members of the Professional Learning Department. We were especially fortunate to have community representation from parents and personnel from Virginia Commonwealth University who specialize in special education staffing considerations. And as Dr. Hamlet said earlier, the committee began forming in October 2018, where we met as a, a, a huge meeting first with all the subgroups. And then our subgroup broke off, and we've met three times as a whole group, and then Many, many times. We've met many, many times. Um, through, and so what we did was we created a flexible means. We did some in person. We did some um, via Zoom so that every, all committee members could participate. We also used what's called a consensogram structure where we put the priorities, we went over the report, put down the priorities, and then allowed each team member to give their own input into the, into the priorities and the action steps. So you may not see it listed explicitly on each slide that follows, but the subcommittee members kept the HCPS four cornerstones at the forefront of all their considerations during our meetings and our discussions and, and formulating our priorities and recommendations. In particular, we worked to maintain a focus on equity and opportunity as these were key missions outlined by the program evaluation. The committee has come forward with 10 priorities that are either lifted directly from the program evaluation or which were brought forward by subcommittee members. In the following slides, we will talk through each of the priorities and the proposed action steps that the committee would like for us to consider as we work together to support the students with disabilities in our division. So the first priority came directly from the program evaluation and that was related to building level leadership. <clears throat> so the first um, recommendation that the committee made is developing the professional learning opportunities for school administrators using the Virginia Department of Education licensure standards which all principals licensed in Virginia have to use but looking also at the standards for inclusive leadership through the Cedar Center so looking at that but also recognizing that we aren't creating a new evaluation system for principals but looking at ways that principals can can make goals principals can um, set norms and self-reflection and we also are making the recommendation that others that train principals and provide professional development within Henrico County Public Schools use those standards and embed those in any um, professional development that's being delivered. We also talked about um, and are recommending exploring, continue to explore the potential for school-based compliance coordinators, so building that leadership too at the building level. Another priority, and as Dr. Hamlet said, one of my uh, research topics is staff diversity. And so the recommendation from the committee is that Henrico County Public Schools participate in events such as Teachers of Color Summit sponsored by BEA, which gives school divisions across Virginia an opportunity to see what are the barriers for teachers of color? What, what, where can we recruit them from? Out, topics like that. Um, and the second is that just to keep abreast of initiatives such as funds offered by DOE that offers teachers of color color um, assistance in passing praxis, which was identified by our governor's committee to be one of the barriers for, for teachers. Okay. Our third priority is in the area of professional development, once again, and you'll see some common th ties throughout mm -hmm. all of these priorities. They really do seem to build <clears throat> and um, connect to one another. First of all, we really want to applaud the amazing professional learning opportunities that are currently in place and being built in the division. The Exceptional Education Department is building a library of web-based trainings and supports that can be accessed by teachers and administrators, as well as providing large-scale special education-specific trainings for our teachers and stakeholders. And this past fall was the first time that we've been able to do that in many, many years, and it was a resounding success. Title II funds have dramatically increased our staff's access to special education specific training that's offered outside of the division. And in the instructional department has supported the commitment to focusing on special education training at each principal meeting and leadership event offered in the division. The committee believes that we need to expand upon our mentoring programs that are currently in place for new teachers. Currently, new teachers are paired with a mentor in their building for the first year of teaching. We believe that this partnership should last for at least a three-year period. 
We also propose that the division employ a model in which department chairs and lead teachers have a significantly decreased teaching load so that they are able to provide site-based support for both procedural and instructional needs. This proposal would have a large impact on our current staffing and scheduling practices. However, it may pose an opportunity to address a number of the recommendations put forth in regard to increased school-based compliance and instructional coaching support. We believe that the division should explore the option of utilizing prep staff as program support instead of only as a source for substitute teachers. Many of our retirees are master teachers mm -hmm. and could provide tremendous mentoring and coaching support by working alongside teachers in their classrooms. And along with that, similar to what Donis just said, new and provisional support for teachers. So looking at the structure of that new teacher week when teachers come in and looking at how we can structure that to expand the time they spend both in the classroom and the time that they spend working with their mentor, um, working with mentor teachers or master teachers as Donis referred to. Um, the committee also looks at, or looking at, um, the instructional coaching staff. We're excited about all the coaches that have come into the county and the, pro and the models that they're using, but we also wanna look at how we can spread that coaching support to special education teachers because we know that's a, a, a need. I was really excited by this idea that came out of the staffing subcommittee, and um, I think it exemplifies some of the outside of the box thinking that's gonna be needed in order to really move us forward. Many of our school administrators and our specialists who supported the committee recognize that we have a large number of individuals who are employed in our county or who are living in our county that are either licensed as teachers in other countries or have gone through educational programming in other countries. And um, the committee recommended that we expand our media communication to try to take advantage of those potential applicants to work and to work with our human resources department and the Department of Education to assist them with obtaining Virginia licenses. Um, we'd also need to collaborate with our ESL department to ensure that communication is going out that's accessible to our diverse community. So I thought that was a great outside of the box idea that came from our committee. Um, the program evaluation indicated that the division should develop an HCPS specific program and policy manual. And really, we're really excited to share that this is already in progress by the Exceptional Education Department in collaboration with our division stakeholders. The manual is being developed on a web-based platform that can be updated easily and in real time with the changes that occur in our division. The manual incorporates policy, programmatic information, and procedural information in an easily accessible manner that's going to pro serve to promote consistency of practice across our division. You'll notice that the next four bullets have a green check mark next to them. You may have guessed what that means. The committee believes that these action steps are necessary, but we also recognize that they're gonna have an enormous fiscal impact for our division. Um, we're excited by the proposed budget. Many of the first steps for our proposals are already represented in the proposed budget. School-based administrators on the committee led the charge to recommend that we evaluate our baseline exceptional education staffing allocations for schools. The committee recommends that we expand our complement for both elementary and secondary schools to be reflective of both caseloads um, and to decrease the number of collaborative case classes that are supported by instructional assistants rather than licensed special education teachers. So in particular, the committee is recommending that we eliminate the use of split positions in elementary schools. In these positions, one teacher may support two elementary schools. The ability to build strong relationships with families and their colleagues in this situation is severely impacted. And we believe that their ability to have a positive impact on academic growth is inhibited. Additionally, the committee proposes that we employ a staffing model where one teacher would not be spread across more than three grade levels. Currently, we have some buildings in which one teacher is responsible for supporting students with disabilities across all six grade levels. This is extremely difficult when you try to build a school's master schedule. It's very hard for that special education to teacher to be in fourth grade language arts and first grade language arts at the same time. Finally, the committee also recognized the need to increase the number of school psychologists who are employed in our division. 
The National Association of School Psychologists recommends a ratio of one to 500 for psychologists to students. Our current ratio in Henrico County is one to 1,618 students. Some psychologists who support CES programs are limited in their impact to their individual school setting, but almost all of our school psychologists support three schools. School psychologists play a vital role in special education program improvement, as well as positive outcomes for all students. School psychologists' time is currently monopolized by their evaluation responsibilities. An individual psychoeducational evaluation can sometimes take more than 20 cumulative hours to complete. And last year, our psychologists completed more than 1,200 initial evaluations. This does not include those evaluations that were conducted as part of a student's three-year reevaluation. Expanding our psychologist capacity will lead to increased access to social-emotional supports, more effective response to intervention, and better behavior programming for all of our students. So um, bullet seven and eight, all of the members of our staffing subcommittee believe that consistency of practice across our division is a key priority. In fact, you've seen the need for consistency embedded across all of the priorities we've talked about so far. The committee proposes that in order to promote consistency, we need to increase schools' access to support from the specialists and coordinators who support special education throughout the division. Currently, there are five exceptional education specialists and 11 coordinators who provide direct special education support to students, teachers, and administrators across the division. Our current organization has each elementary specialist supporting 23 buildings and each secondary specialist supporting 11 schools. Support is aligned geographically. Our coordinators report directly to the specialist and are each responsible for at least 11 schools. Four of the coordinators specifically support autism programming and programming for the integrated services programs. These individuals provide individual teacher coaching, professional development opportunities, su support with teacher evaluations, IEP development, eligibility processes, discipline procedures for students with disabilities, and a myriad of other school-based supports, including participation and facilitation of any type of contentious IEP meeting. Any principal or teacher in the division and many of our parents would reiterate that they rely heavily on the support of their special education um, specialist or coordinator. The committee believes that we could better support our schools and families by developing a two-team model of support, differentiating between compliance and family engagement and instruction. We're proposing a model that would provide instructional support specific to the instructional needs of our students distinguishing between those students who are accessing the grade level curriculum and those who are working toward more functional skill development. We've not fully developed a proposal of a new structure, but we believe that by adding at least two 12-month positions to our existing department, we would be able to develop a model that could provide deeper and more efficient support for our schools in meeting the needs of our students and families. An additional priority, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> The next one is the instructional assistance, which came right from the program evaluation, and you heard the mm -hmm. um, proposed financial plan earlier, which talked about that. Um, in order to eliminate the temporary positions, we would need 350 full-time instructional assistants. Um, and so we recognize that that is a multi-year plan. Um, finance is collaborating, is, is already working on that, and I believe that we are, we will convert funds for 35 full-time instructional assistants for the upcoming year. We recognize that, that that's not the 350 that we, we know we need. However, we're certainly making plans already. The district is making plans to, to get us there. The final um, recommendation that came from the program evaluation that we talked about are grow your own programs. Grow your own programs are programs where you use the resources that you have or re you use resources to fill the need that you have and the need is special education teachers. So currently it, um, Human Resources is initiating a regional teacher residency um, program with three special education teachers and I believe they're going to be at Elko and Highland Springs High School. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So we want to explore more opportunities like that and using one of the things that was really exciting um, recommendation that came out of the committee, the out, of the out of the box innovative thinking that we talked about earlier is using our own or using the staff in Henrico County Public Schools that have these in endorsements and credentials mm -hmm. to teach our own teachers, to, to develop a program where we are creating a pipeline of special education mm -hmm. teachers all the time. So we don't have to recruit because we, we have them right here. Um, and also exploring opportunities to expand our special education connection to the teacher scholar program, as well as to Glen Allen specialty program. So those students will graduate and come back as special education teachers. So as we stated earlier, none of the priorities that we've talked about so far can be completed or um, maintained by one department of, alone. And this graphic represents what we all know to be true. In order to truly reach those positive outcomes for students with disabilities that we all hold to be so important, we're all going to have to work together throughout each and every department of Henrico County Public Schools to achieve these goals. Um, we are really looking forward to continuing our work with our staffing subcommittee and our collaboration with the other um, stakeholders in Henrico County and the other work groups to further our goals and further our progress toward building our special education programs. And so that's part of our next steps, of course, collaborating with the other subgroups, collaborating with other stakeholders, but also receiving any feedback that the school board has for us. And then we're going to examine the impact to make sure that we have some way to measure effectiveness and looking at additional data to support the recommendations. All At this right. time, we'd be happy to entertain any questions you may have. Well, that was very thorough and a good, a good first opening salvo, I think, from mm -hmm. feedback from our groups. Does anyone have a question on, this, on the material that was presented today? Mrs. Cox? I don't have a question, but a comment. I am excited to see that we do already have some of these things in place in the budget, and so we are moving in the right direction. And thank you for all of this work. It was very thorough and uh, it gives us a lot to take pause. That's Mike, I'm ready. Yes, I do have yes. one. Going um, back to, if we can go back to the slide with number three and four on it, that'd be great. Um, you talked about um, our instructional coaches, and I, I've heard actually from a couple of teachers lately that they never see them, and so you know they they know they're out there. They and do you know, or you can tell me, you just send me information. I would really like to know how many instructional coaches we have now and where what schools they're working in because I do hear that that they don't see some schools don't ever see them at all and that kind of thing. So I'm just curious. Um, yes ma'am. So as far as special education mm -hmm. specific coaches that were hired through the Office of School Improvement, mm -hmm. there were four instructional okay. coaches hired. Those coaches are spread across eight buildings. So each coach That's supports right. two buildings. Um, they are led by, um, uh, I don't know her specific title, let's just call her a master coach. Mm -hmm. And she also um, provides special education coaching support. This coaching support is only relegated to my understanding to new teachers. Okay. So much of the support that our teachers receive is still coming from the, those coordinators and specialists okay. that work with our schools. And, and I think that may be, if they're only working with new teachers, that may be the, the issue is because I'm not sure that our current teachers understand yes, that. So they think that there's a, they're a resource that maybe they're not. So, yeah. okay. All right, I appreciate the clarification. Please, Ms. Ogburn, if you're ever talking to teachers and they need support, please encourage them to reach out directly to my office okay. and I'll ensure that someone speaks directly with them. Okay, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Did, Chair. Yes, Mr. Uh, at number three there, um, I think it's really wise uh, to look at that prep staff because you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Absolutely. There's a lot of wisdom there and a lot of practical experiences. So if we can make that happen, I think that's a win. Yes, sir. So, we, we have a few prep staff at this point who we use in kind of coaching and modeling support, specifically in some of our um, more significant, our classrooms of students with more significant disabilities. And their, their input and their support has been phenomenal, and it is life-changing for many of our teachers. They're able to be in a classroom for two weeks at a time, whereas one of our autism coordinators being spread across so many buildings isn't able to commit that amount of time to one teacher. So yes, sir, I was excited by that recommendation as well. Good. 
Mr. Chairman. Yes. So, um, Don, is, is this presentation going to be um, on our website so the public can see this? I know it's in board documents, but what methods are we using to make sure that everyone knows that we are um, intentional, that we are laser focused, and that we're going to do everything we can to make sure that we have an industry leading um, special education program in, in, within our division? Well, I will tell you the truth. I have not considered that at this point, but I love the idea about linking it to our website. Of course, it's going to be here in board docs, but I think that it is really important that maybe we could create a section on our website for well, that. Well, even if it's not the, the, the robust nature of this particular presentation, but I just think that you know we're, we're focusing on, a, as a school board, transparency and, and, and communication, and I just think that this is a hot item meaning that a lot, of, a lot of stakeholders are very concerned about what are we going to do, how are we going to do it, how can we measure the impact, how do we know we're making a difference, because at the end of the day, it's about the families that we serve. And, you know, they're, they're important, but we want the, uh, the broader community to know how serious we take this issue. We actually do have a page that's dedicated to the uh, program evaluation that was done. And so every time one of these subcommittee reports is um, presented to you, it will remain in board docs, but we can also post it to that page. And the program evaluation report remains under hot topics as well. So any uh, stakeholder can find suggestion. it on our website. Well, well, I definitely area. think you need to link this because the person's not going to really look for it, right. but we want, to, we want it to kind of like be blinking. We want it to be, hey, listen, this is, this is here. So if you Great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Madam Superintendent, our last item on the agenda before we get to unfinished business. The last item, um, Mr. Sorensen is coming forward to provide a review of a concurrent resolution regarding a permanent working group to review salary compression. Mr. Sorensen. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. So I just wanted to uh, provide a few comments on this. So this is a concurrent resolution, as Dr. Cashwell indicated. It was adopted by the Board of Supervisors at the meeting on Tuesday night. So this work group is a really important piece as we move forward in the compression. You know, I talked a little bit in the budget presentation about uh, we have realigned the teacher salary scale, career ladders are next, but the work group is really important for us to, to keep track of all these programs and monitor the progress to make sure we are in fact uh, minimizing compression moving forward. And we have that as an action item for tonight's uh, monthly meeting. So yes, sir. anything further, Madam Superintendent? That concludes items from that concludes items from the superintendent. Thank you. I can hear you. The, uh, is there any unfinished business? Any new business from the board? Uh, and I will announce the upcoming uh, meetings on February 14th. Of course, we have our, our, our monthly meeting here at 630, but at February 14th at 2 p.m. our work session, um, followed at 6 p.m. by a budget hearing here in the New Bridge Learning Center. The meeting time for the work session is subject to change uh, and will be announced. There being no further business, we will adjourn.